Hi folks, this is Nick Pulizzi from The Sacred Science, and I'm here today with a very special guest, Sandra Ingerman. If you're immersed in the world of shamanism, you most likely already know who Sandra is. Her work has been an inspiration to many of us for decades. A few dear friends of mine have studied with her, and the powerful books she has written have changed countless lives, including my own. Sandra is a world-renowned teacher of shamanism who has been awakening her students for more than 30 years. She's a best-selling author, who is recognized for bridging ancient cross-cultural healing methods into our modern life, addressing the pressing needs of our times. How are you, Sandra? I am doing great. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. It's so good to be here with you. Yeah. It's been, it's been a long time. We've been, you know, I've been following your work probably longer than you've been following mine because you know, <laughs> when I was living out in Colorado, I, I, I had a few, a few women that I knew were, were students of yours and they always, they always, uh, you know, just tell me these stories of awakening and connection and just feeling like they were rooted more firmly in, in the earth after they went and visited you. So. Oh, that's great. So it's interesting to me, like, you know, I feel like a lot of people, when they think about, you know, sh shamanism, shamanic practitioners, they envision indigenous folks wearing in, in traditional garb that, you know, look like what we might have thought of uh, as, uh, you know, as being like spiritual healers that National, you know, National Geographic would have shown us back in like the 1980s. So here we are, we're in the, we're in the outback of, of Africa and here's, here are these people. But you're someone who's so respected as being, you know, um, a pioneer in this world of shamanic healing here in the States. And I think it's really, it would be exciting to kind of hear how you got to this place as an American. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was, first of all, I was always a spiritual little kid. You know, it was just something I was born with my destiny. And, you know, I, I woke up every morning. I couldn't believe how beautiful i grew up in brooklyn new york so um, we're talking real america here yeah. and um but you know i'd go outside and the trees and the colors i just really couldn't believe it and then when i was seven years old i was hit by lightning um which i don't remember where i went while i was hit i just remember my mother and my brother were actually in the room with me it was a stray lightning bolt that actually came into our house um, wow. and threw me against the wall and i said mommy i died mommy i died and and later on i learned that that was the classic shamanic initiation experience but i didn't know that and i didn't know where i went and I did grow up in the 60s, and um, I did the whole 60s thing, and, um, and did a lot of mind um, expansive um, plant medicines. And I knew that there was something more than what I was experiencing where I lived, you know, just going to work and coming home and drinking beer and watching TV and going to bed and, you know, people fighting and crying. And <laughs> I lived in an immigrant um, neighborhood and everybody was screaming all the time. That's all you could hear coming out of the windows. And I knew there was something more to that. And, and then uh, I moved to the Haight-Ashbury in uh, San Francisco, but nobody told me that Haight-Ashbury had actually been buried. Um, that news hadn't hit uh, Brooklyn yet. And then I had another near-death experience where I drowned in Mexico. And, and that was um, one of those big near-death experiences going down the tunnel, following out into the light. Wow. And then um, had another near-death experience when I drove my car off a cliff um, uh, up in Oregon. And... I always had a, a feeling because I had this expanded spiritual state of awareness due to my time in the 60s, but also my near-death experiences where I experienced the light, oneness, source, God, whatever you want to call it, and that unconditional love and that unconditional peace. And I, I knew what the opportunities were for people and for myself, but I, I had no path. You know, I just had spiritual insights, but I didn't know what to do with them. And then I was really gifted 
Um, I got my BA in marine biology, and then I realized I really miss working with people, and I went to um, the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco, and I got my master's in counseling psychology. And while I was going to school there, um, I was working there too, and I was told that uh, a guy was coming out from the East Coast and was going to teach a workshop on something called shamanism. I didn't know what it was. And they said I could get two easy units if I signed up for the workshop. And I was working 60 hours a week to put myself through school. So two easy units sounded good. And it was Michael Harner, a well-known mm -hmm. anthropologist. And he was teaching a weekend workshop on how to do what's called shamanic journeying. And I had my first journey and I met up with what's called a helping compassionate spirit. And he just started answering every question I've had in life and uh, just downloaded an amazing amount of information for me. And it was like, I found my path. I, I found a way to work. And I did uh, continue and I got my master's in counseling psychology and I became a licensed therapist and started working with clients. But what I started to notice was those clients who were willing to learn the practice of shamanism were moving through their issues so quickly. And the clients where we were doing traditional psychotherapy, we were just spinning around in uh, circles and not moving forward. And so at some point, um, I just let all my clients know that I wasn't doing traditional psychotherapy <laughs> anymore. And they could stay with me or I could refer, refer them out. And that kind of started some of my shamanic career. I, I don't know how many uh, people uh, know what shamanism is, and so I can give a very brief introduction. Please. The, the practice of shamanism is actually the oldest practice known to humankind. Um, we know from the archaeological evidence that it dates back over 100,000 years. And I know that a lot of your work has been in Peru and, and South America. My interest in shamanism has more been from the Central Asian traditions, the Siberian shamans, the Mongolian shamans. And the word shaman itself comes from the Tungish tribe in Siberia. And it means one who sees in the dark or healer. And in the practice of shamanism, and there are so many um, synchronicities of the same practices all over the world. And so you know that there was some form of communication going on, you know, tens of thousands of years ago to have very similar practices. But a shaman is a man or woman who goes into an altered state of consciousness either through using percussion, which is how I teach and how I work, or using plant spirit medicine, which many cultures use. And in that altered state of consciousness, a veil between this tangible material world um, opens up into a beautiful reality um, called non-ordinary reality, the unseen worlds, the hidden worlds, the, the dream time by the Australian Aboriginal uh, elders, the other world by the Celtic shamans. So there, there are many different terms. And because shamanism dates back over 100,000 years, there, there's a lot of misunderstanding. Um, people think that shamanism is more in America is a Native American uh, term, but actually people practice shamanism pretty much everywhere um, around the world. And so everybody listening to this right now, I'm sure, I'm positive, has an ancestor who practiced shamanism. 
And so shamans go into this altered state of consciousness and go into the unseen worlds where there's a wealth of what we call helping compassionate spirits, um, power animals, guardian spirits, the spirits of trees and elves and um, ascended masters and angels and mythic figures are all waiting to, they have this different perspective on life. They're sitting in the bleachers watching as we humans are playing the game of life and they're going, no, look to your left, look to your right, you know, move in this direction. And so they have great compassion for us and they're trying to lead us into a place of higher evolution and personal health. And then the role of the shaman was to perform healing ceremonies for people who were emotionally or physically ill by uh, bringing back lost power or bringing back soul essence that got lost through uh, trauma or taking out a spiritual blockage from the body or removing what's called a possessing spirit. But what's really important to me and, and what's been important for me to share um, in our modern day world is not just the classic practice of shamanic journeying of getting the help from our helping spirits and being able to heal ourselves and being able to heal others and the planet, but shamanism is a way of life. Um, it's, it's where shamans wake up and they greet the sun every day because it was not believed in indigenous cultures that the sun might come up every day. And so when the sun came up, you wanted to welcome it and thank it. And honoring earth, air, water, and the sun for all that it gives us so that we can thrive and, um, in life. And, um, honoring nature and talking to the trees and the plants and and the animals and um transmuting the energy behind our thoughts so as human beings we came here to experience extreme bliss to anger and and depression and despair that's all part of the human experience what we came here to experience but in shamanism, thoughts are things. And so what we send out, the energies that we send out in the world end up impacting ourselves and all of life. And so learning how to say, I am angry about what's happening in the world right now, but I only want to feed myself and the planet with love and light. So learning how to transform the energy behind um, our thoughts and words are seen as magic and have power in shamanism because of the vibration uh, that they have so that we manifest energy into form by the words that we use and also our daydreams. In, um, in South American shamanism, it's talked about that we're dreaming the wrong dream because every here, everything here is a dream. And so with our daydreams, we're either dreaming chaos and the nightmare that we're seeing in the world right now, or we're dreaming beauty, peace, and harmony, and good health, and abundance, and equality. And so really watching what we're daydreaming about, that's part of shamanism. We're, we're really here to be dreamers. And so because um, my master's in counseling psychology and because uh, I was a psychotherapist, my interest in shamanism is how do we bring the practice of shamanic journeying, uh, using shamanism as a way of life and performing ceremonies to change our personal lives and to help with the current challenges of the planet because in indigenous cultures, shamans worked in very culture specific ways of the needs of the people. And, and life has changed. We, we're not living in an indigenous culture, not most of us who are listening anyway. And so how do we bring these ancient practices into our life 
to make our lives better and the planet a better place to live. And there are teachings that go back thousands of years that teach us how to do that, just a few that I have already mentioned. And so um, what is shamanism is a big question. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I find myself when people ask me that, sometimes you can stumble on it because it's just so, it's such a massive topic and it's, it's kind of, it's so simple that it's complex. You know, it's, it's so old and it's so rooted in everything that to try to describe it in a sentence is really, really, really hard. Yeah. Thank you for, thank you for painting it in such a beautiful way. I think that's something that's inherent in what you just said that that is exciting. I mean, there's so many things I want I want to jump on here. I want to talk about I would love to talk about the spiritual component and the, the actual spirit, um, the 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 spirits that you meet during journey. But I feel like um, what you just spoke about is profound in that it make it takes this the idea of shamanism away from being a thing that you need to be in a faraway ceremony in some exotic location with some you know some generational master you know to being this very simple no it really isn't that way in fact potentially your whole life could become a ceremony if you just start learning some of the basics on how to how to be how to actually the way of being how to actually truly be in this world so i don't know i, I would love to i'd love to ask you for people who are listening right now who whether or not they are experienced with shamanism and, and different ceremonies of the world or not what do you do? I mean, as a, as a human being living in this world, I live, I'm living right outside of, you know, New York city right now. We spend the other part of the year in California near a major city. And like, I'm not, and, and I'm not saying I'm, I'm like the spiritual being in a, in a world full of zombies. Cause I think everybody's a spiritual being at, at different levels of want, wanting to be awake. So, and I think that there's plenty of people that are, that are really looking to try they they have that itch. They know there's something more that they're not quite connected to like you, like you're saying, when you were in Brooklyn, you knew there was something more, you know, right. as part as part of the itch that probably got me to, to do what I, what I'm doing now too. What do you do as that person who doesn't have access? A lot of people don't have access or the, or the financial resources to go fly to Peru or to fly to Siberia or wherever, you know, the, um, you know, these ceremonies are being practiced. So what do you do as a human being living in the modern world who just wants some more connection? Well, um, <clears throat> there are actually pretty easy ways uh, today to do this. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not um, I'm not talking to you to push my books, but I've, <laughs> I've written books. Please, please do. How to journey? Um, mm -hmm. Because you, the thing about um, shamanism, there is a, a complex issue. Before I go on, uh, to be a shaman you know, to actually call yourself a shaman or to be a shaman. To call yourself a shaman is seen as bad luck in indigenous cultures because it's your community that calls you a shaman. It's a destiny. It's a call. It's not, I think I'm going to be a shaman. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I get a lot of those letters. I think it looks like a good idea for me to be a shaman. <laughs> and actually it isn't because the initiations you go through don't stop and they're not pleasant um, because a shaman is a wounded healer and it's all about being able to um, have that heart that's always open and always being in compassion. And so the spirits do not make life easy for a shaman. So it's not the romantic path that a lot of Westerners think that it is. But everybody in the West can practice shamanism. And there's a difference between being a shaman, which is a calling, and you will know if you're called. There, <clears throat> there isn't really a mystery or a wondering about it. There's no confusion. <laughs> but everybody can practice shamanism. Everybody can learn uh, how to meet up with a helping, compassionate spirit. And so um that's what my my books are geared towards is not a person who is looking to set up a healing practice and and start to work on people but how do we bring these ancient practices into our daily life to be able to ask our compassionate spirits you know i'm having a terrible time with my boss my boss is not getting me 
and and I feel there's a misunderstanding and not asking what's wrong with my boss that that would be unethical from a shamanic point of view but how do I change my behavior at work so that I'm more successful and I have better communication skills with my boss and my staff I'm just giving a very practical example of how people today can use shamanism um, in their life. Um, I haven't been feeling well. What's out of balance in my life that it looks like I can bring balance in? So these are the kinds of things that helping compassionate spirits can help us with is how do I manifest my greatest dreams to be able to experience the goodness that life has to offer? Um, how do I release through ceremony how do I do a fire ceremony where I write on a piece of paper that I don't feel worthy and I bring that bowl and the fire to the spirits and I say, take this from me. I mean, that's a very simple, you don't have to travel to another country to um, learn how to move into a sacred space where you do some meditation or singing or dancing or drumming or rattling and putting some music on and letting go of your egoic thoughts and your concerns and your burdens of the day and where you step into the world of spirit from a place of heart and you say to the spirits please help me please take this from me i'm gonna blow my problem into a rock and bury it into the earth. Please take this pain and turn it into fertilizer for the earth so that new plants can grow in the spring from what I just um, released. These are really simple things that we can start to bring into our life to bring the sacred into our life and to wake up and start to think about what am I grateful for instead of this is gonna be a really bad day you know, I, I, I know what I'm getting ready to face. Instead of starting your day like that, which creates a foundation, starting your day with, you know, I, I really enjoyed um, seeing that flower in the park yesterday, something really simple. And when you start your day like that, it changes your life. And, and the thing about shamanism, is that the principles are so simple because they come from a pre-technological culture. So learning how to give thanks and, and to go to a park and, and sit by a tree and to just open yourself up. And when you sit by the tree, see if the tree communicates to you by giving you a symbol or a feeling, you feel it in your bones, the tree just try to connect with you, or you hear a message coming from the tree, opening up your senses, or you take a walk in, in a park in, in New York City, and, um, or in San Francisco, or any large city that you are, and you say, I need to make a choice um, between these two relationships or these two job offers or whatever, and I'm asking for an omen. And when you think about one, a rainbow shows itself in the sky. When you think <laughs> about another, something else shows itself. Um, the sun, the clouds go over the sun. Uh, that, that's shamanism. And when you start to bring these very simple practices into your daily life, all of a sudden you realize that there's more than just the tangible world and collecting more material objects or um, getting a new device or whatever. There's all of a sudden a veil opens up where you realize that um, you live in a bigger universe. Um, than you were originally thinking <laughs> you were, and that there's magic, uh, there's challenges, that's nature. There's life and death in nature, we see it constantly. 
um, there's change in nature. We see that constantly. And so part of living a shamanic life is also learning how to ride the waves of, of turbulence like we're in right now in our culture and not to go down with the collective, but to, um, a shaman would say to you right now, start to dream a good dream for all of life. See, hear, feel, taste, smell, step into the world that you wanna be living in and look out from that world and operate as if that world has been manifested into existence now. Uh, be a dreamer. And a shaman would also say that the turbulent waves that we're going through right now are bringing us somewhere. They're helping us to sculpt away our ego. Um, and to allow our spirit and our light to shine through because who we are beyond our skin, um, our body and our mind is where spiritual light. And we, have, we actually have the same power as the spirits. It's just that we chose a body and we chose a role to play out. Uh, this time around. But um, part of the practice of shamanism too is remembering the truth of who you are, which is spiritual light, and to shine that light. And so the times that we're in right now is the fabric of reality is dissolving intentionally because it's not working, it's not supporting life. And so the turbulent times that we're in are helping to sculpt us into the spiritual beings that we can be and evolve with the earth changes. Um, and so there is a reward at the end, there is illumination at the end of the dismemberment that we're all experiencing right now so it's all part of it's all part of the practice of shamanism thank you for thank you for that that's the I, i've got you my head is swimming with with questions for you but i mean i feel like that's there's so much there's so many tools woven into what you just said there's so many little takeaways whether it's the physical things like you know um infusing a rock with something that you that's no longer serving you or you know the the the, the the um the fire exercise where you where you write something on a piece of paper and you offer it up to the spirits but all the way through to like just the essence of what you're saying of be as being it's not only shadow work but it's just sort of this idea that challenge is where we challenge helps us and you know but what's the the roomy the roomy quote uh the wound is where the light enters you so it's like the idea that you know the struggle and the suffering is really you know, a catalyst for our own tr spiritual transformation it's a way of us like trimming the trimming the fat, you know, and like, you know, getting more pure and in alignment with who we actually are and who we want to, you know, leave this world, I guess, leave this world as. A question I have for you, and like, I, you know, I, I know that we don't have a lot of time. I just want to, I want to ask you one more, one more question. And it's about, it's about spirits. You know, there's a lot that we're talking about here, you know, spirit, spirit guides, what, however people, however people might want to think of them, these other beings that are there waiting for us on the, you know, as we cross the veil, um, you know, that separates this reality from, you know, the, the other, the mystery, the invisible world. Do you believe that it's, um, do you believe that there, these spirits are actual spirits that have their own consciousness that have been one, maybe at one point a living, you know, inhabited living bodies? Cause I think people hear the word spirits. They think about things like ghosts. They think about things like, so do you, is it more of like a metaphor that, that, that helps to add, that helps our human brains that are wrapped, that are sort of, that sort of cling to these, they need some kind of a frame, a frame of reference, put something on um, uh, an energetic being or a, you know, a, a, or just a source of energy that might be hard to describe using words? Yeah, well, <clears throat> for me, uh, I'll talk about for me and what I teach. What I teach is that uh, number one, the spirits are the intermediaries between us and source, um, because source is just oneness, doesn't recognize us as egos, just is a brilliant light. And so the spirits are intermediaries, but they're also formless. They're dead, they're deceased. They don't have a form. They no longer have a body. 
but what they're willing to do for us is they're willing to take a form for us that speaks to us on some way um, as a human being. And sometimes we don't even understand it. Like some people get a mouse as a power animal. Um, in the Eskimo traditions, mouse was seen as one of the most uh, powerful power animals that you could have. Um, mouse has a lot of different uh, teachings to teach us about how to navigate uh, through life. And for some, it's an eagle. Um, for me, the goddess Isis manifested, but she she's formless. For some people, it's Jesus or Mary or Buddha, uh, Kuan Yin. Um, and so the spirits take a form, not necessarily because we want them in that form, uh, the spirits might take a form that we're afraid of, like a snake, or um, but they come through and they teach us very, very individual lessons, and they help to show us where to put our next step. What I'm trying to teach right now um, in shamanism is that we're also formless beings, and we're also beings of light. And I feel that we've put a little bit too much form on the spirits because our personality needs it. And we're taking away some of the power of what they can bring through as these formless frequencies and energy. And we take away the power of what we can do to serve the planet because we get so stuck in our ego and personality. And so I've been teaching people more and more how to contact their own spiritual light radiate that like a star does in the night sky or like the sun does every day. And that healing, uh, that light brings a frequency that uplifts the whole collective. And when we join that with the, the formless energy of the spirits and we get away from our habitual need for methods and techniques, but work with our formless energy and the formless energy of the spirits and, and the energy of light and love, there's nothing we can't do. Uh, there's nothing we can't change. There's nothing we can't transform. And so I think that's the evolution of consciousness today on the planet in the 21st century is learning how to work more from a place of unity, uh, and more from a place of uh, uh, feeling empowered by our own spirit and working with the formless energies from the unseen realms. Does that help? I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It totally helps. But my, my brain is just, my brain is like racing. I've, I've got so much to think about now after we, after we get off this call. I think that people who are, who are watching are probably feeling the same, same amount of richness. It's like, there's so, there's so much to process, but it's, thank you for, thank you for putting words on, on phenomena that are, that are very hard sometimes to describe and to understand unless you're experiencing them you know, in the middle of, if, unless you're in the middle of them, in which case most of us still can't usually describe them, so. Yeah, and I also wrote free articles that are on my website, and there are YouTube videos, and I really do make it very easy to explain and understand uh, for people to absorb uh, the basic principles of what shamanism is about and what the positive that uh, that practice can bring into our lives right now. Can, so if, if people want to go deeper with you, what's the best way to do that? Well, um, the first step would be to go to my website, SandraIngerman.com. I write a free monthly column. I haven't missed a month since 2000 where I keep people inspired. And so uh, just reading that and some of the articles will help. I, I have taught a bunch of online courses that are still available to sign up for. So if you can't travel to a workshop, um, there are online courses that take you step by step through shamanic journeying and how to perform a ceremony. And uh, then uh, one of my latest books, Walking in Light, 
has everything that we just talked about um, all in one sweet little book that you can uh, go through slowly and start to learn how to bring the sacred into every moment of your life. Walking in Light. Yes. That's what it's called? Yeah, Walking in Light, The Everyday Empowerment of Shamanic Life. Oh my gosh, I have not read that one. I can't wait to read that. Yeah, we'll, we'll put links you know, people who are watching right now on, on Facebook Live uh, might not get the links right away, but um, people who are watching this on our blog will get all these links underneath the video. Sandra, thank you so much for, for joining us today. It's really an honor. Yeah, it's an honor for me too, Nick, and I'm always happy to come back on, lead your group and some experiences. Really? Help the group go deeper into the work too. So we'll stay in touch with each other. Really? You? Oh my gosh, that's amazing. I would be honored. Oh my gosh, that, that's, that makes me very excited. Thank you. Yeah, we'll um, take you up on that for sure. Yeah, and thank you for all the brilliant work that you're doing. Yeah, well, um, you know, you, you helped lay the foundation, so really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Many blessings to you and to everybody listening. Likewise.